There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I've a peace that has come here to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers of so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. The world seems to sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art. Man, thank you, ladies, for that. What a blessing. We are in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, yeah, Hebrews chapter 4 this evening. Amen. And I do want to just take a minute, just acknowledge the, the testimonies of uh, the past five weeks and the work that God has done. And uh, it was a blessing to see Brother uh, Abshendik, the Abshendik families, our mailman get saved. And I really can't take time each week to acknowledge every uh, miracle that happens. But I think it's a wonderful thing to take note of a testimony of uh, 25, perhaps 30 years of just being a witness and an influence. And uh, sometimes in a Christian life, we have the sprint effect where we want the immediate gratification of, uh, of laboring for the Lord when uh, we just continue, don't be weary. Faint not. Amen. Stay faithful. That's the requirement of a steward. And uh, this ministry, we get to see the manifestations of that. A lot of times people would give up after tw- after five years, after 10 years, after 15 years, 25 years. And uh, don't ever give up on those that God crosses your path with. And it's amazing to see uh, through it. Amen. Uh, what God can do and just continue to stay faithful. It's a wonderful testimony. And I want to not just acknowledging one family, acknowledging the good grace of God and uh, how that works. Works. Amen. Hebrews chapter uh, 4. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Our text verse for tonight uh, is verse number 13. Before we read that in verse number 14, you'll see uh, the emphasis on the last portion of the scripture. The author of Hebrews is dealing with the subject of holding fast our profession. And that's a wonderful challenge for you and I to understand the responsibility uh, to stand fast, right? Very similar verbiage from Paul uh, throughout the Pauline epistles, the church epistles, of the responsibility, even from Paul to Timothy on what we should do and how we should live, and the responsibility to stand fast, hold fast the profession, and make sure that we're faithful all the way to the end, amen? There's got to be that part where we endure. We endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus. Jesus Christ. The text tonight, verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, 
But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There are no secrets with God. I'll preach on this thought tonight, holding back from holding fast. What holds us back, one of the things that can hold us back, is convincing ourselves that we're better than we are. It's convincing ourselves that nobody saw that. And in verse number 13, how clear is it? You're not going to get any clearer than to look at that verse and to see the vulnerability and the exposure, the reality of what God already knows about us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, but talking about the last days, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, when the Bible there, Paul's talking about in the last days, evil men, it's talking about those that are on the outside, right? Those are the, let's say they're the enemy to the cause of Christ. They live in adverse mindset to the things of God. They're anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christ individuals, evil men. But it also talks about seducers. Now, seducers are fakers. Those seducers can be on the inside. So there's the reality is that there's those that are attacking the things of God from the outside, but then there's also seducers on the inside who work to present themselves as being something spiritual and they try to puff themselves up. And here's what it says about them. It says that it's going to wax worse and worse. And then it gets to this point, deceiving and being deceived. Now, the reality is you and I, all of us, at some point or another in our lives, we can be fakers, can't we? We can be the seducers. We can be, if you will, the individuals that that, that have an agenda and we can manipulate that agenda to our own personal advantage. But the reality is that when you do live with a, a deceiving mindset, you will be deceived. There's one thing you can say about a deceiver is it doesn't take very long before they think they've mastered the game and somebody's mastered them because there's always a bigger fool because ye are of your father the devil. When you manifest a mindset of deceitfulness and manipulation, there's always somebody who has a little more street credibility and a little more street wisdom than you do and you will get played even while you feel like you're the one that's doing the playing. That's on the inside. Now that should be very scary for all of us to understand that within us dwells the fleshly carnality of the effort and the labor that we can to deceive ourselves or deceive somebody else into producing something. And the end result of all that is it holds us back from holding fast. And as long as it's holding us back from holding fast, then we know that, that we're, we're convincing ourselves, if you will, uh, 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 in the mind that we have secrets that are held back from God. Verse number 12 lays bare the reality of that, doesn't it? Verse number 12 tells us, look at it, says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We heard about the, we heard about the word this morning, didn't we? Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In verse 13, it tells us that there's none. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. That manifestation of the reality of who we are and what we are has never been a secret to God. A lot of times we look to the left, we look to the right, we look all around, we just don't look up. Because God sees it all. There's much labor and ingenuity that goes into deception, isn't there? Sure there is. If you, you, you've seen things about people that, in the ingenuity, I've watched it even at, with criminals and, and some of my family that are police officers. <laughs> the ingenuity of a deceiver of a criminal is unbelievable. Uh, what you can do with this mind when you're, when you're bent on destruction and the, 
The things that you can come up with, it's, it's really, I mean, it's really, we could talk about, it's astounding. Criminals and prisoners and different things, the way they communicate, and how they get contraband in and out. And even, hey, by the way, even all the way down to, if you will, even to the little Christian school kid in the academy who thinks he's deceiving, that thinks he's getting away with it, there are no secrets with God. When the Bible says there's manifest, not, there's, no, there's not any creature that is not manifest in the sight, but all things are naked and opened unto him. Those two words are very interesting. Not only the naked part in regards to the exposure, but also the open thing, which is a very unusual word there that has the, the connection really with the vulnerability of, uh, uh, of even a wrestling position, really, that Greek word there. And it's very important for us to understand that there's a vulnerability when you and I think that we are, we got it all under control and that we've got these secrets and they're compartmentalized and nobody knows it. When the book just said there in, in that portion of scripture that from the joints and the marrow, that's the inside, the inside of the inside, it divides it and the thoughts and the intents. See, well, I didn't do anything wrong. No, we're, we're going to give account for every idle word. The thought of foolishness is sin. Father, I pray that you be with the message tonight. The opportunity that we have to be challenged by it. And I pray that you'll help us to be changed as well. Hold fast that profession of faith, Lord. Thank you for loving us. The opportunity to be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 3. I'll just give you a couple examples tonight uh, in regards to uh, why it's important to understand that there are no secrets with God. There are just basic tenets of Christianity that are of utmost importance to be reminded of because a lot of times we can convince ourselves that we can convince ourselves that it's A-OK. There are many people that fill out your tax form and you think you did it right or you think so or you think, well, this is no big deal and you just miss just a little bit about it and it may not take very long before you can get audited and realize, oops, that was wrong. You thought we push it because we think we can get away with it. We always push certain things in life spiritually, thinking that we can get away with it because there's not this big booger man that's in your life who's hounding you from behind right on your shoulder and he's saying, oh, you shouldn't do that or oh, you shouldn't do this or there's not somebody that's yelling at you. There's not somebody that's telling you no. Now, there should be the Holy Spirit of God and at that point in your life where you've grieved him away, then you're definitely going to be in trouble. But we're not going to hold. And I think every one of us, you're here on a Sunday night because you have a genuine desire to want to hold fast, amen, to stand fast, to stay faithful. But that's not going to happen in your life and in my life until we realize that those secrets that we're holding on to is actually holding us back from holding out or holding back, hold us back from holding fast to the cause of Christ. In Genesis chapter 3, let's look at this. Let's look at verse uh, 9 and 9, 10, 11. It says, the Lord God called Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? Should not eat? Now I want you to think about that. That was just the voice of God. How about the presence of God? Adam didn't have the completed canon of scripture. It was just the voice of God that showed up in your, in, in Adam and Eve's life. And it was just the voice of God, the thundering voice of God. And that, the thundering doesn't even mean it had to be a, a, a audible as far as a loud audible. It's just the voice of God. And it should be in all of our lives where that Holy Spirit of God should be able to speak to us. And whether it's a still small voice or it's a bombastic, bombastic voice or it's heralded like a trumpet, we're in our lives the reality of the, secrets that we're holding on to and the thoughts and the intents of the heart and what is a discern of the word of God of the joints and the marrow of our lives where we get right to the the, the, the the gist of the reality of our condition. We say, hold on, there's trouble right there. Adam and Eve, they, they were in a perfect setting and they disobeyed God and it was because of their disobedience that God said, whoa, hold on, hold on. Who told you you were naked? 
Isn't it funny right here in Hebrews and chapter four where it's dealing with the same thing was laid the naked, naked and opened. And, and that's exactly what happened from the very first instance of nakedness was a violation. And Adam and Eve thought that they could cover themselves. They thought they could cover their own nakedness and get away with it. And that's what happens when you and I are deceivers and being deceived that we can convince ourselves that whatever the sin is in our lives, that we can try to manipulate. And we're so good today to not clean the law laundry to get all the dirty laundry out there we try to conjure we try to angle it we try to get to the point and a place in our lives where we'll say just enough to make sure we placate to somebody else that may need to know or has to know or may have caught us and instead of us genuinely repenting we hold back the whole point of us in, in the relationship with God is if we're going to hold fast we can't hold out on our sin we are just tell God what he already knows about us what a wonderful thing. Amen. What a wonderful thing to just get it out. It's a wonderful thing to be set free. And so often we just put ourselves in prison by the, by the foolishness of the mind and the foolishness of the tongue and the foolishness of our lifestyle. We convince ourselves that it's not so bad because you know somebody who did worse than that. And look, they're still being used by God. And look, they still do that. And we justify our carnality while we're limiting our potential and limiting our power. Adam and Eve caused sin to be cursed upon all of humanity. Because of, the, because of the rejection of the word of God. And as a result of that, they were deceived by the devil and they continued that deception. Who told thee? The reality is all of our lives, the Holy Ghost should be enough to tell us even before, even before, you know, it's way better just to listen to him before. We've all been there where we had a chance to listen. We didn't listen. Zip it. Zip it. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. And you and I take the bait because we didn't listen to the Holy Ghost of God. And we get ourselves in trouble. Joshua chapter 6. Look at this. Not only Adam and Eve. Look at Joshua chapter 6. How about Achan? Joshua chapter 6. Look at verse 18. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Lest ye make yourselves accursed. What, isn't it amazing? That we know we're playing with what? We know we're playing with fire. And somehow we think we're not going to be burned. I mean, it doesn't get any plainer than that, does it? I mean, look, look what God's warning was to the children of Israel. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron and are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Isn't it amazing how we can just convince ourselves? Hey, when it comes to giving. Everybody okay? When it comes to giving. You see, because the IRS lets you audit out everything you want to audit out. So when it's at the end of the day, you can excuse not having to give because you can justify why I really don't make anything because it's all marked out. Stay with me. You're touching the accursed thing. You get to the point where you're, you're in a bad situation when you're looking for excuses to not give as opposed to give. You're not going to answer to me. You're going to answer to God. But man, we're in, you're on the wrong playing field when you're messing with what is 100% God's. Do you understand if God asked for us to give 100%, we should all say, yes, sir. Yeah, there's like six of us that are okay with that. A hundred percent. It's all his anyway. If God wanted a hundred percent for us, has he ever seen his, his people forsaken and begging bread? Which means that if God's, God can't lie. So if God said, if he did, he said, give me a hundred percent, he'd still provide for us. Well, that doesn't make any sense. There's a lot of things that don't make sense. But by faith, we just believe it. 
Hey, listen, if you want to live robbing God, you're, the great Christian heist is Christians that rob God. Man, you'll talk about the great, there's a lot of heists you can study out in the world history. But I'm telling you, when you study out, when you study out the greatest heist, it's the child of God who has been bought with a price, and we want to argue and wave our fists back at God. And most of the time, it's because you're just trying to pay for something that's anti-God anyway, which is why you justify why you can't afford it. I wasn't even preaching on that tonight. The accursed thing. Don't mess. Don't mess. Well, God, you don't understand. It's hard down here. It's expensive down here. No, no, no. You don't understand God. You always come up the loser when you rob God. Every time. You're a young person. I, th- I thank God. You know, one of the wonderful things about grow- one of the many wonderful things about growing up in a Christian home is that giving has never been an issue. I thank God for it. Like, that's just what we do, right? That's just what Christians do. And I'm not talking about rounding to the nearest penny because I, I, I try to raise my children, my wife. I was raised for my parents the same exact way. No, no, no. How about we tithe for what we don't even know is going to happen in a week? Yeah, I know, that, that's a different level. You, I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just telling you something about New Testament Christian giving. And by the way, the New Testament, the Lord said, you ought to do this, you should tithe as well. Because there's, I know, great confusion. I'm going to teach on this coming up, but there's great confusion on tithing. Well, show me where tithing is in the New Testament. Come on. You want to end up on the short string of life. You justify why you don't have to give God what is his. You don't tithe to Phil Cavanaugh. You don't, t- listen, you give to God. And that's, that's one of the responsibilities of a local church, an opportunity for you to be obedient to what God commands. And then the offerings after that, what a wonderful thing to be part of. All that we enjoy around here because of the good given of God's people. Missionaries supported around the world. Why? Because there's people that say, let's give the missions. And then we have missions conference and people say, let's give more to missions. And then we have another missions conference and people say, let's give more to missions. And then there's building programs. Hey, let's do this so we can do this. Hey, let's do this. Let's have vision unlimited so we can pay for a well that's going to blow or a driveway. Or we can do all this. Yeah, let's do it. And you follow the vision that's laid out there. You're obedient to God. And many things are accomplished because of the faithfulness of God's people. Now watch this. Look at verse number 19. Look, actually, drop down. Go Drop, drop down to chapter 7. Look at that. Chapter 7, verse number 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of uh, Zabdi, the son of uh, Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Drop down to verse number 11. Israel has sinned. They have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled uh, also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Look at verse number 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, have I sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted, watch this, I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and nobody can see it. No, and the silver under it. Listen, I'm, there's no secrets with God. How, how many stories do you have to go through in the Bible and time and time again where we, we create these little caveats in our own lives that, oh, nobody saw that. Oh, good. You, ever, you, you know when you slip and fall on ice, what's the first thing you do? You look around. And you're like, oh, is there any cameras around here? Because you don't want to be on the next episode of, you know, Fools and Ice, right? It's instinctive in us. Our, our, our terrible fleshly nature. It's evidenced by our pride. You slip. What is that? What is that looking around? I mean, we haven't even hit the ground. You're like, I hope nobody saw this. Push. I mean, it, hap- it, it happened. As a matter of fact, I pulled in, I was in the Menards not that long ago. I pulled in the Menards. This guy, it was a rainy day, and it hit that, the painted stripes. I'm telling you, this older gentleman, man, his feet went up in the air, and he just came, boom! 
And he just laid there. I mean, I was too far to get to him quickly. And I'm, he's just laying in a puddle. And it was, you know what he did? I mean, you would think that your broken neck potential. No, there's never an instant broken neck. It's always this, right? The neck's good. Can't move my legs, but the neck's good. It's in us. That pride is in us. He answered Joshua in that confrontation. And so often we feel like, that's no big deal. Go to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5, the story of Naaman, captain of the host, the king of Syria, was a great man, master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance to the Syria, and he was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And obviously we understand the miracle that transpired there by his eventual obedience to Elisha and what God wanted him to do in verse number 15. And talking about he, and he returned being Naaman to the man of God, Elisha. He and all of his company came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Drop down here. Just a couple of verses. Look at verse number 20. Watch this. But Gehazi. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian. So he's talking to himself. When you get lost in your head, you're in trouble. Hath spared Naaman the Syrian in not receiving at his, at, at, uh, his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it funny how we can invoke the Lord to make ourselves sound better? I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I really feel like this is what God wants for me. Man, we're so good at it, aren't we? Look at Gehazi. As the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, all is well. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garment. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver and two rags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, "Uh, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Wet not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments? And olive yards and vineyards and sheep and auction and manservants and maidservants, the leprosy. Therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. That's just a hard reality, is it? But for some reason we can convince ourselves, man, I had good intentions. Who knows if that wasn't a partial truth that there was two sons of the prophets coming from Ephraim. Because there really could have been. But he mixed that with lies. He mastered it with carnality. He mastered spiritually by saying, as the Lord liveth. And he, had, he could have come up with all the great intentions. It's like this. Hey, I'm going to gamble because if I ever win, then I'll tithe on it. Gambling is rooted in covetousness. It's anti-God, it's anti-the Bible. We don't gamble. Thank you. You don't do it. 
But yet we can convince ourselves just as Gehazi. So you can look at Adam and Eve and we can look at, I mean, how many more do we have to go to? You go to Jonah, right? I mean, Jonah, think about Gehazi, think about Jonah. These, these were individuals who understood who God was. Gehazi stood there at the door with the man of God and watched the miracles after miracles. We're talking about a man who experienced a double portion of the power of God in his life. And Gehazi stands there. He watches. He had just witnessed the miraculous healing of Naaman and Naaman's leprosy disappearing because he went and dunked himself seven times in the Jordan River, which was originally resented by Naaman because, man, there's so many better waters, bodies of water back in Syria. But he got to the point where he was willing to have faith and be obedient. And he witnessed a man who had leprosy. What a terrible, by the way, type of sin, but what a terrible disease and and what it did to the body and disfiguring and and the oozing sores of leprosy. And really, I can't even be as graphic as the reality of what leprosy actually did to him an individual. And there he is witnessing this all for this man to come back after his obedience and stand there before the man of God rejoicing and saying truly there is no God like the God of the Bible, like your God or like the God that you serve. Gehazi standing right there before his master. Front row seat. Coveted, doubted. What? Elijah. You're a fool, Elijah. Well, why, why wouldn't you take that? Look, look at us. Look where we live. Look where we live. Man, we could get an upgrade. We could, we could feed more people. We, we could do more for the cause of Christ with that money. And he thought he could sneak out. He thought nobody would see him. He thought that, listen, if you and I, if we can't even fool man, how do you think we're fooling God? Because when you, when you deceive yourselves, you can actually believe that nobody knows. Nobody knows. And yet there is a God in heaven. You know, in our lives it can become routine that we hold fast our reputation, not our profession. The routine is when we care more about what other people think about us than what God already knows about us. And everything that God already knows is like, um, not a secret. Not a secret, folks. I already know that. I already know what you look at. I don't know what you watch. I already know what you were thinking. I already know your agenda. I already know the subtlety of your heart. I already know that you've got an internal clock counting down where you can get away from God and get out of church and away from the book and away from mom and dad. I already know there's an eternal clock that's already clicking in your life because you are deceived and being deceived into thinking that there's something else that's better because of that carnal mind. There's no secrets with God. You, you and I as humans, we are, well, man, what happened? What happened? And you're looking at this, and the reality is God's not shocked by any of it. It's all laid bare. It's all there. There is no secrets. It's time and again, we see individuals whose lives are laid bare and exposed. Because of deceiving and being deceived, the outcome has very negative consequences, generational consequences. I think you and I should be not only scared for our own reality of what God knows about us, but also the reality of how in these years uh, that we live, that all of it is a sowing part of our lives. And God forbid that we reap that in our children and grandchildren because of our own negligence to uh, just face the reality of our spiritual deterioration and compromise that needs to get rooted up and taken out of our lives. The author to the Hebrews, and also is relevant to us today, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast. How do you hold fast? Two things real quick. Number one, let go. Let 
let go thinking that you can hide sin. Let go believing the devil's lie that this is just the way it is. Make the best of it. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Let go of the reality of what God already knows. Look at verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest. Hey, isn't it wonderful if you're going to let go to do it to that one right there? The great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let go. You can't keep bottling up. You can't keep burying in your life. You can't keep living duplicity to where you're pretending to be one thing and you know you're not right with God. It's going to be manifest. And if you can't, you and I can't fool man, how in the world do we think we're fooling God? And what's holding us back from holding fast is the reality of secret sin in our lives. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Galatians chapter 6. God sees it. God knows. And the best thing we can do is just let go of what he already knows and say, God, I'm wrong. And have genuine repentance. College students, young adults especially, because I've dealt with you that age group for long enough, not only myself, but that age group long enough to know that I have seen young man and young woman struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle. And there's this little, there's this little Baptist routine. We can talk about the Catholics and their little confessional to a priest, but I promise you this right now, Baptists have their little routine as well, where you'll go tell God you're sorry till you're blue in the face, but there's no genuine repentance or vehement desire of restoration and you keep petting your sin and you feel bad about it but you're going to wake up one day and you're not going to feel bad about it for some odd reason it's because you've grieved the Holy Ghost of God way out of your life and you've had a change. You've sinned your day of grace away because you keep petting that little sin thinking it's no big deal instead of you getting broken and a contrite heart before God and realizing that whatever it is that you keep meddling with it's going to destroy your life sir. It's going to mess your marriage up one day. It's going to tear your family apart. It's going to destroy your children and you can have those vengeful little little thoughts that this is no big deal and you keep compounding and compounding and compounding secret sin. There's a God Almighty. He sees it laid bare, naked and open. Your neck is fully exposed to God Almighty. There's a full rear naked choke going on in your life and you're the one that's allowing the devil to choke you out. You're never going to hold fast. And we're going to hold fast. There's no chance. There is no chance. Man, but the whole message here from Hebrews chapter 4 is, man, we've got to hold fast. We've got to hold fast. We've got to get honest. We've got to tell God, done. We've got to let go. The second thing is we've got to let's go. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly. And to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's something to be said for the obtaining mercy. The Bible tells us that whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall find mercy. What a wonderful thing. You tired? You tired? One of the most beautiful things that, that when you work with people spiritually... One of the the most precious moments of grace manifested in a person's life is when an adult, a young person, when they come to you and whether they got caught or they repented, they go like this. (sighs) I was so tired of hiding it. I had to work so hard. It was just so terrible. Man, what a day of revival. 
What a day of revival when there's just that freedom. That's what this is about, freedom. Where you just say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done doing it. My, I'm going to go boldly to the throne of grace so that you can find mercy and grace. It's available. More grace. Grace upon grace in our lives. We don't deserve it. If it's available there, get right with God. Get right with one another. Get accountable with authority. If you find yourself saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God. God," There's obviously something missing in your life. You need accountability. Northwest Bible Baptist Church, Providence Baptist College, Northwest Baptist Academy, Kite River uh, Revival, Campground, all of the entities of Northwest have been built on the Word of God and accountability. I have no desire to change that. Accountability is what produces. The path of least resistance allows you to produce nothing. The path of least resistance allows you uh, to produce nothing. The product of least existence. Oh, there's a lot of those around here. You can't go to church tonight, though, because they don't have Sunday night services. You can't go on Sunday nights. So you, you can go on Sundays, though. Sunday mornings, or maybe Saturday nights. There's always a path of least resistance out there. You can get told what you want to hear and make yourself feel good, but at the end of the day, it's all going to be laid bare, naked and opened. Very vulnerable. Why don't we just get vulnerable now? Let go, and then let's go. We go boldly to the throne of grace. What a wonderful promise from the word of God that we can find help in time of need. You know what we know about these perilous days? There's a lot of help that's needed, isn't there? Man, we got it all down. Reputation. Reputation. God's not worried about our reputation. He's worried about our character. He's worried about our profession. Let's not be so loose with what we say that we are when we know there's not a lifestyle that proves it. Let's step up. I didn't preach on, preach on a whole list of sins tonight. I didn't have to. Preach on the reality that in all of our lives, if you were just, hey, do you understand the revival that would happen? Come on, stay with me. Do you understand the revival? How many of us in all of our lives right now, you could say, Pastor, I know if I spend five minutes, I could probably come up with something that's in my heart and in my life right now that's got to go. Come on. We can't get honest in church. Come on. We can't get honest in church. Where are we going to get honest? Do you understand if we actually dealt with whatever the reason was, not the peer pressure because somebody else raised their hand next to you, but you genuinely, you know that in five minutes I could find something that's got to get on my Do you understand what it ha- Do you understand what happened to this place? You understand the revival that would happen in our homes? You understand the revival that would happen in Elgin? In our little towns, our families, our marriages, our child rear? Do you understand the revival that would happen if we spend five minutes? Say, God, you show me one thing. I'm not, hey, listen, I'm not trying to overburden you today. I could with this message. We could, we could get brass tacks tonight on this message. But you know the reality is, what if we just took one thing? No, 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 it may not be infidelic. It may not be adultery or fornication. It may just be, it may just be covetousness. It may be pride. Resentment. Anger. Lack of patience. Selfishness. Murmuring. Discord. said I wasn't preaching on sins, now we are. <laughs> and you're just like, okay, you can stop right there. You're right. No secrets with God. And just like I asked you all to, a minute ago, how many would say, yeah, within five minutes, I know there's probably something that's got to go. I think the same amount of people would raise their hand to say, Pastor, I, man, I want to I wanna hold fast. I want to hold fast. It's possible. It's possible. It should matter. 
It should matter to us that it's possible, but it's not going to, we're never going to hold fast as long as we allow sin to hold us back. Confess it, forsake it, obtain the mercy. And what a wonderful thing that 1 John 1, 9, to the Christian is there, that even despite who we are, God says, I'll not only forgive you for what you ask, but I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Ha, thank God for that. Are you kidding me? Because we don't even know what we think about when we're sleeping. I don't even want to know. Who knows the sin, the anger, whatever could be there. You're thinking about it all night long. But man, you're faithful. He's faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a God. Since he already knows it, why don't we tell him about it? And obtain that mercy. Experience the grace of God to press on the whole fast. Father.